everyone. My name is Bavia Suri, and I am the health educator for the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation. Before we start the webinar, I'd like to take a minute of your time and introduce this year's National MS Education Awareness Month Toolkit. The theme for 2023 is MS in today's world. There's a toolkit. If you are currently subscribed to our quarterly MS Focus magazine, then please be on the lookout to receive your 2023 toolkit in the next upcoming weeks. If you are not subscribed with us, please respond to your registration or reminder email of this webinar, and we can add you to our mailing list. This toolkit has different activities such as checklists and worksheets that can insist in keeping you grounded, but also finding new ways to prepare you for the upcoming future of MS. There are topics in here to guide you in your personal journey of living with MS, like advice featuring one of our speakers this month's webinar, Dr. Werfel, sorry, healthcare tips such as advocating for yourself or the latest updates on FDA approved treatments and how to navigate within your MS community. To make this toolkit and today's webinar possible, I would like to thank our sponsors. Thank you all for your time, and I hope you enjoy this webinar. All right, thank you, Bavia. Hello, and welcome to the National MS Education Awareness Fund Conference, hosted by MS Focus, the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation, and made possible with support from Biogen, Genentech, EMD Serono, Sanofi, Beatrice Sandoz, and Bristol Myers Squibb. I'm your host, Aaron Fine, the Social Media Marketing Coordinator for MS Focus, and I'm joined by Dr. Adam Shapit, who will be talking to us about affording your MS care. After, after a presentation from Dr. Shapis, we'll open it up to your questions and comments. Now, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker. Dr. Shapis is a board-certified chiropractic neurologist. Since 2008, he has been the program coordinator for the Comprehensive Multiple Sclerosis Center and the Department of Neurology at the Jacksonville campus of the University of Florida. He manages the program through the interaction with patients, providers, and ancillary staff personnel. He is also a strong advocate for patients and interacts with governmental relations representatives and local and federal legislature. Dr. Schaefer has been in clinical practice since 1987. His expertise has always been in a collaborative medical environment. Dr. Schaefer has run and managed the largest chiropractic practices in Jacksonville. The first chiropractic rehabilitation center director in Jacksonville, he has always been at the epicenter of collaborative care with his patients. Utilizing medical physicians in practice, his patients have always benefited from a thorough, comprehensive approach to healthcare. Now, we are pleased to have him join us to present this important topic. Dr. Schaefer, thank you for being with us, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you all for uh, joining us today. Thank you, Aaron, and thank you uh, to the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation for allowing me to share some, I hope, important information that patients can utilize um, going forward in, in this challenging time of MS care. Um, I do have um, some things that we're going to address, hopefully things regarding care, mainly medications and some other forms of treatment. So hopefully we can find some solutions to some of the hurdles that you've been having. So when we talk about affording MS care, we, we really have to put things in perspective and have to understand that um, to give you all an idea, and we're going to talk a little bit about how much care costs today. And when I started in this position 15 years ago, the average disease modifying therapy, and there were only four or five at the time, the average cost of those drugs was probably two or $3,000 a month. So I want you to keep that in mind as we go forward and look through um, this presentation because I'm gonna try to break down almost every single drug and different aspects of what you need to know about this, okay? So I'm gonna say that the first and most obvious thing when it comes to affording your care is gonna be what? Winning the lottery, correct? Um, however, that's probably not gonna be the way that most of us are gonna be able to finance our healthcare. Um, if I win the lottery, 
I'll just buy my own neurologist, right? Um, but that's not um, that's not feasible for most people. So what we need to do is we're going to break down today the challenges that our practice and our practice is a comprehensive multiple sclerosis center. We specialize in MS and we're pretty good at trying to navigate the system for patients, whether that's medications, whether that's services, but we're even coming up against some of the most difficult times that I've ever experienced in all my days of practice. So I'm gonna just briefly describe some of the challenges that we're seeing. First of all, generic drugs. And I know that as some of the patients are out there listening, that this has already hit them because we've had several drugs that have gone the generic route. And um, when this happens, it can really um, disrupt patient care for a number of reasons. And so we're gonna kind of explore some of those reasons and, and some hopefully some remedies to it. Infusion therapies have become more common in the MS landscape. And because infusion therapies are more common, um, the type of insurance that the patient has is going to dictate where exactly that infusion can be done. Um, we're, we are a hospital-based system, and because we're a hospital-based system, many of the insurance companies will not cover infusions that are done within our system. So it complicates patient care by having to send them out to ancillary uh, infusion centers. And then the cost of therapies, want you to keep in mind, we just talked about it, 3,000 a month. So the cost of therapies has gone up considerably. And because of the cost of the therapy going up, the patient obligation for the therapy is going up. First thing I wanna talk about is the efficacy or the effectiveness of multiple sclerosis medications. So they're, they're, they're going to be grouped into three categories. You have an injectable, you have an oral, and you have an infusible medicine. Now in every one of these cases, um, we're talking about expensive therapies. Now, when we look at injectable therapies, we're looking at your Avonex, beta serum, Copaxone, and the injectable therapies are what used to be called platform therapies or first line therapies. And they use the term first line is because back 10, 15 years ago, they used to think that every patient had to start with an injectable medicine. So they became known as platform medications. So when we look at the total effectiveness of these medications, they're probably on the bottom of the list of all of the medicines. Now, does that mean if you're on a medicine and you've been on it since you've been diagnosed and you're doing great and you don't have relapses and you don't have progression, that that's a bad thing, it's not a bad thing, because what we find is that these medicines are extraordinarily safe. And so we see patients still choosing injectable medicines for a couple of reasons, one of which the insurance plans sometimes force patients to them. But one of the main things is that they are absolutely the safest of all the medicines that are available for MS. So when we look at the, the landscape of patients that are on injectable medicines, um, to give you an idea, um, 15 years ago, 100% of patients were on injectable medicines. So I would say today you're probably looking at 30%, okay? And the oral medications, 
which is supposed to be the next step in therapy. Um, if, if you fail the injectable route, then it's, it's good to look at the oral medications because across the board, they have a higher level of effectiveness and believe it or not, patients didn't mind taking pills over injecting themselves every day, every other day and getting flu-like symptoms. So it's no wonder that the oral medications have become a favorite in, in MS care. And then the last- Excuse me, Dr. Chaffetz? Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you, sir. But I just wanted to know if you wanted to put up your slides for the uh, audience to see. For the what? Your, uh, your slides for the audience. Oh, they're not up? They are not up at this moment. All right. Um, Sorry, I know you were on such a tear. Can you see anything now? Uh, not yet. Yeah, I'm having a, give me just a second. Let me, let me see. All right. Let me go to Zoom. Let me go to share screen. Let me go to that. Can you? There we go. What's up? It looks like we got it, sir. Thank you so much. All right. Give me just one sec. Um, can you see it now? We can see your slides, yes. Okay, so you see that one, the lottery yep. slide. Yep, absolutely. Okay, all right. So we went through the challenges and, and my, my apologies, I thought everyone could see these. So when we look at the efficacy of medications or the effectiveness of these medicines, as I mentioned, um, we're going to start with injectable medicine. So 15 years ago, everybody was on an injectable. When the oral medications came out, we had patients that wanted to switch medicines, even though the injectable medicines were great for them because they were sick of injecting or they were getting injection site reactions. And then Infusion medications, the first one being Tysabri back in about 2005, that was the first infusion medication that was introduced. And we did not have a lot of patients on that medication. We had probably five or 10% of our population on it because infusions were new and infusion therapies are much riskier therapies than oral medications, and certainly much more risky than injectable medications. So over the past 15 years, we've seen the development of very high level therapies enter the market, okay? And if you look at data from research and you look at the ECTRMS, which is one of the conferences in multiple sclerosis, they feel that under treating a patient can be very significant. So you see patients who are opting to go on infusion therapies, even as their first therapy. So an example of that would be a patient that has very aggressive disease, would might consider either Tysabri or Ocrevus. When we look at multiple sclerosis management and we look at the day-to-day, -day, every day, what our office is dealing with, um, we're seeing the introduction of more generic medications. And when a drug goes generic, um, it takes the insurance companies and the specialty farm pharmacies absolutely no time at all 
to start denying the brand therapies that some of these patients have been on for many, many years. So it becomes very problematic for patients because they start panicking about being taken off of a drug that they've been on for quite a long time. Now, we also have an abundance of therapies that are out there. Again, when I started, we had five. I think we're looking at probably 15 plus therapies now. So the more therapies that are coming out, we're starting to see a little bit of an overcrowding in the market because some of these newer therapies that are coming out do not have a new or novel approach at treating MS. And then the new therapies that are being introduced, unfortunately, some of the companies that are, that are throwing themselves into the mix have not dealt with the MS population. And so the way that they're going about uh, offering assistance and just transitioning patients has not been favorable. Hey, Dr. Chaffetz, I have a question for you real quick if you uh, were yeah. open to answering it. Yeah. Uh, one, of our, uh, one of our audience members asked, I thought Kisemta was considered a high efficacy DMT. Is that not the case since it's an injectable, or is that the only in injectable DMT that is high efficacy? Okay, well, thank, thank that person for asking, because Kisemta really shouldn't be grouped in that. Kisimpta is essentially an infusion and an injection. So Kisimpta is a very high efficacy injectable, and it's the only high efficacy injectable. The rest of them have a much lower efficacy rate. So thank that person very much for asking that question. It is absolutely an exception in that class. All right. So when we talk about affordability of medicine, maybe it might surprise some folks that it may actually stop a person from being on medicine, okay? So I was looking to see if I could dig up some research studies or a research trial that I could highlight to demonstrate a few things. And I came across this research study about treatment patterns among patients with MS that are initiating a second line disease modifying therapy. Now, what that means is that every one of these patients, and this is a large study, we're looking at over 4,000 patients in this study. And basically, the average age was 46 and it was 76% female. So it hit the perfect cohort of what you would see in an average MS patient. So when we talk about second line therapy, most if not all of these people were on injectable therapy. So when these patients went to switch, approximately half of them switch to an oral medication, 36% switch to an injectable, and 13% switch to an infusion. Now, when they did this in total, okay, out of all the classes mentioned, there was only a 32% reduction in relapses. So that is around the efficacy that you see in the injectable class. But I want you to understand that the, the more biting statistic in this is really the fact that more than half of the patients, okay, only 54% of patients who switch drugs stayed on that drug after a year. So that, that right there tells you that when a person has to make a drug change, whether it's because it's not working or whether they can't afford it, that that has a dramatic effect on the patient's future treatment. 
Okay, so among all of the patients with MS who switched DMTs, the, the, the persistence was low regardless of the treatment. So even though the oral class did better, just because you're taking an oral medication doesn't mean you're going to stick with it, All right? So we're finding that patient compliance, or they call it adherence or persistence in this, um, in this model. So what do you do? I mean, what do you do when you've already tried a medication and the medication you're on, um, you feel great and you feel like it's working and you go to your neurologist and they examine you or you have an MRI done and you see new activity going on. And you get that pit in your stomach because you know you may have to change your medication. And so when you do that, that is a whole brand new journey for some folks because you might be switching from an injectable to an oral or an oral to an infusion. And sometimes the process is completely different for each type of therapy that you're on, okay? So one thing research definitely um, solidifies, and that is, is that patients who are compliant with their medications have a decrease in relapse rates and a decrease in progression. That could be clinical progression and or radiographic, which means new lesions on MRI. Now, the study demonstrates that it's very common for patients who have failed the first-line therapy to have a poor compliance rate. So the goal from the get-go, if you can, is to find the best therapy and stay on it. But what is the best therapy? The best therapy is the one that's keeping you relapse-free, without progression, without relapses, okay? And so with the changes in the landscape of care, here's some reasons that I'm seeing for patient noncompliance, all right? Now, I want you to understand too that when you're on a high-level drug, that means that if you have a break in therapy, that you could probably suffer a little bit more than somebody who's on a lower level drug because many times we try to match the level of therapy to the aggressiveness of the condition, okay? So when you take a person who's been on a brand medication for 10 years and a generic now is out and CVS calls you or Credo or whoever the local culprit these days is. And you know they're devious because they know you're on a brand drug. So they contact our office and say, uh, Mrs. Smith needs to have a new prior authorization for her drug. And so you go through the process of doing it and then you get to the last question where they ask, has the patient been on the generic version? And of course, it was never available, so you have to say no, and they automatically deny it. So patients will get pushed on to a generic therapy by their insurance and by the specialty pharmacy. Now, depending on the insurance you have, some of these governmental insurances are going to do it automatically. So for instance, if you have TRICARE, and you're on a brand medicine that goes generic, you will get the generic. It will be almost impossible to get the brand, but the good thing is the generics have effectiveness and they're affordable on the TRICARE plan. Let's look at another government plan, Medicare, and these are the patients who are gonna be 
the most drastically affected. And the reason why I say that is because even when a Medicare patient has a supplement insurance or a Medicare patient has an advantage plan that covers drugs, the co-pays on these plans are very high. And shortly, I'm going to go through all of the drug prices as of this year, and you will see very quickly why, if you have a 10% copayment, why that will break the bank, okay? And then um, another reason why patients end up off therapy is they never are guided through the process of starting a new medication effectively, okay? And then another reason that I see clinically is that the patients already wiped out that they were diagnosed with MS. They're already mentally, you know, dealing with having to be on a drug, and then they find out the drug they're on isn't working. So now they have to start another one. And so whenever patients are starting that second therapy or even a third therapy, you know, there can be anxiety or hesitance because of the experience that they had before. And it, and it really doesn't mean it's going to be the same. I went ahead and took the time to look up all of these medications. So if a person had to, had to buy them out of their pocket, what exactly would they be paying? Okay, so this is the injectable class. And you'll see all of the old ones on there from a decade ago. And though that's Avonex, Beta Serum, Capaxone. And let's start with Avonex. Okay, Avonex is an injection. You get four pens a month. And the price tag on that is about $8,000. So if you're looking at an injection, you're looking at a $2,000 price tag for each syringe or each pen. Now, if a person had to go and buy that out, you know, out of pocket, um, the good RX price is going to be half of that, around half. Okay, so beta seron, the first, the first DMT introduced into the market in 1993, 30 years old this year. And you can see their price is almost $9,000 a month. And if you were to buy uh, the brand name on GoodRx, you can get it for half the price, right? Now, Copaxone. Copaxone was the first drug to go generic. And when Copaxone went generic, um, there were two different companies that have offerings for the glutarimer acetate solution. So if you look at the price of Copaxone, and then you look at the price of the Viatris glutarimer, and then you look at the price of Glotopa, those all three are biosimilar drugs. Um, you'll see that there's quite a difference. So if you were the insurance company and you had to pay the bill and you had your choice of these three, you can see kind of why some drugs end up on a formulary list. Now, if we look at Rebif, Rebif is one, one of the old classic great injectable drugs. And all these drugs are effective. Like I said, if you're on these drugs and you can afford them and you're not having problems, then God bless you if, if that's the case. But many times patients are facing drug changes, not because they want to, but because of insurances, because of insurance formularies or because of just plain affordability. And then the last one I wanted to look at was key symptom in the injectable realm. And that, you know, is right in line with, with the other therapies. And so I had to put a little 
St. Patrick's Day in there by putting a little pot of gold in there. I hope you all can appreciate that. Now let's look at the oral medications. So if we look at um, Abagio, uh, you're looking at 30 pills for $9,000. So it's about $300 a pill. Um, Bafir Tam, a, a brand new uh, biosimilar product to the market. Um, problem with new drugs is that many times they don't make the formulary lists. So if you try to get a drug that's off of a medication formulary for your insurance, you're going to have a difficult time getting it. And then um, the medication Tecfidera. Um, Tecfidera has gone generic. And believe it or not, um, the dimethyl fumarate turns out to be the most affordable out-of-pocket drug that an MS patient has as an alternative. And I'll expound on that later. Um, if we look at Jelenia, uh, Jelenia is, and Mazent, they're very similar products made by Novartis. These are around the nine, nine 10,000 range. Um, Ponvori, again, is another relatively new oral drug around 9,000. And then Tecfidera, like I said, um, Tecfidera, the generic, the dimethyl fumarate, um, is the only thing available on GoodRx. And you can actually get that drug for $40 a month. Um, and it's incredible when you think of a $10,000 drug um, going for $40. So as you can see, the prices are just unbelievable. Now, if we look at Boomerity, which is another product that's, that's a Biogen product that's very similar to Tecfidera, again, it's right in line with all of the disease-modifying therapies. Now, I'm not going to down industry for pricing their products because, folks, they're the ones that develop these drugs. So I do believe, you know, that they are due uh, to make a profit. Now, the one thing is how much profit is debatable. So I will just kind of leave it at that. Now, we go to our last class of medications, and that's infusions. and Many people, when I started uh, 15 years ago, never thought that the price or cost of MS therapy would literally be more than a house. And that's what we're looking at here. We're looking at, you know, very high level therapies that, um, that unfortunately have a very high price tag, but some of them are very unique. Um, the medication Lemtrada is a limited medication that the patient takes for two years. And because the therapy is only two years long and comes to an end, there are patients that have been off of therapy for 10 years and have not had a relapse or progression. So if you look at the savings to the system for the cost of DMTs that are at least $100,000 a year, that could be a real bargain for an insurance company. Now, the medication Ocrevus, Ocrevus is an infusion that's twice a year. So in order to get started on it, you have to take two half doses, and then six months later, you take a full dose. The price of this is about $75,000. Um, and then Tysabri is a monthly infusion, and the drug cost is around, around $9,000 every month. So you're looking at about over $100,000 for that infusion. Now, the thing you also have to understand is that this is just the drug prices. That does not include the infusion administration costs 
and depending on how long an infusion is, um, some infusions like Lemtrada are done over the entire day. So it's like a five hour infusion. All right. So if we look at the oral medications and we look at one injectable, these are the medications that are that are generic or are going generic. And the first one in the field that went generic was Copaxone. Now, Copaxone um, was manufactured by the Teva Corporation, but the two versions that are offered as the generic are going to be the glutirimer acetate, which is made by Biatris, or Glatopa, which is made by Sandoz. And once again, you have to confer with your provider. If you are um, changed to a generic version, we've had many patients over the years for Copaxone, for Tecfidera, um, that have had to switch, and we've not had um, terrible side effects or any real serious problems. So, but that is something you need to discuss uh, definitely with your provider. Okay. And again, we saw kind of, you know, what the prices were of these drugs. Um, Tecfidera now, the generic version is dimethyl fumarate. So when we see generic drugs that come out, and in the case of Tecfidera, and in the case of Gelenia, which is the next one on the list, here's the problem, folks there probably are 10 different companies that are making the generic version. So when CVS or Credo or Express Scripts or whoever calls you, how would you know which company is going to give you assistance for the drug? So we're starting to see real problems with the specialty pharmacies not being able to match up the assistance that some patients have had. Now, other patients have done fine. So I think it's something we're just going to have to look at in the future. And then for those of you that are on the medication Abagio, um, the medication is not generic yet, but will be going generic this year. So again, the good RX prices, if you were on Copaxone and and you have to stay on Copaxone, and you don't have insurance, and you have to pay out of pocket, then you're looking at $1,200 a month, okay? If you were on Tecfidera, and you can no longer get the drug because of your insurance plan, then dimethyl fumarate on GoodRx, believe it or not, folks, it is. $39.57 for a 30-day supply, okay? So, Fingolimod or Gelenia, $760 for a month supply, okay? So, those that have multiple manufacturers are going to be a problem. And so, hopefully, you have an insurance plan that can go ahead and coordinate with you a, an appropriate way to afford these medicines. Because, I mean, think about it. The insurance company wins if you don't jump on another medication, and I mean quickly. Um, and you cannot afford to be off of medication for longer than, you know, any time because your providers don't want that. And it could put you at risk if you're on a high-level medicine. So these are the companies that have branded, branded products. And these are the ones who are going to give you assistance one way or the other. So Biogen has Tysabri, Boomerity, Plegrity, Avanex, um, Novartis, uh, for the time being, they're supporting Gelenia, but luckily they have a product 
Mazent, which is very similar. Um, they also have Kesimpta, and Glotopa is actually um, a Sandoz product, but Novartis, it's a, Sandoz is a spinoff of Novartis. Uh, Janssen is um, the Ponbori uh, company. Genzyme makes Lemtrada and Albagio. Genentech makes Ocrevus and Enspring, which is an NMO drug. And Zaposia is made by Bristol. Uh, EMD Serono makes Rebif and Mavenclad. And then Banner Life Sciences makes Bifirtin. So the generic formulations for the, for the Copaxin, believe it or not, have been the most difficult for patients. And so that right there is an example of the safest drug on the market, hands down, and a patient who chooses that may not be able to actually afford it. And that's very sad because at one time, our practice probably had 40% of our practice on that drug at one time. So patients who are on brand medication where a generic is available, folks, if you haven't renewed your prescription or your authorization for your medications and they've gone generic, be ready for this, okay, please, because they are going to try to pull it. Now, when this happens, what we're seeing is that the specialty pharmacies who are supposed to know how to connect patients with affordability, um, they are kind of dropping the ball. Like, let me give you an example, okay? We had a drug that, um, that went generic and it was Tecfidera. And we put a patient on dimethyl fumarate through his Blue Cross plan and CVS was a specialty pharmacy, okay? And CVS wanted to charge him $1,700 for the generic, never telling him that it was available on GoodRx for $40, okay? So that's how devious these pharmacies are. So if you go to GoodRx and do a dimethyl fumarate search, you'll find CVS is one of the providers on there offering it for less money. So it makes no sense how convoluted this whole process is. And the one thing I want to warn you about is if you are starting a new medication or you are changing medications and you have never gotten this medication before and they're delivering it, never accept delivery of that medicine without knowing exactly how much it's going to cost you. Okay, please do not do that. And this is a great time to review your health insurance plan and know exactly what your copayment obligation is. Okay, for those of you that are jumping to Medicare, um, Medicare doesn't cover everything. And you wanna make sure that you're, you're very smart about the plans that you choose for supplemental um, things. And last, the patients who have governmental insurance, TRICARE, Medicare, or Medicaid, a lot of times are excluded from assistance programs. So that's something that you need to bring up with your legislators and find out you know, why government patients can't participate in these programs. If a person has to go, um, for patient assistance. Um, these are some of the, the foundations that fund medications. Now, the way it generally works is let's say you're on an oral medication A and you're just starting. When you start the medication, you complete a form, you send in the form. And if that company funds a foundation, they're going to direct you to a foundation to help 
with your co-payments. And so some of these, like the Assistance Fund, the PAN Foundation, the Health Wealth Foundation, these are, these are financial um, foundations that frequently fund multiple sclerosis co-payments for things like Medicare medication. So how does the process of foundation funding work? Well, it can work a couple of ways. First, we have to do the start form for a branded medication. Um, unfortunately, we're seeing that the generic companies are not offering free drug to patients, okay? So it's, it's upsetting, but they are basically in the market um, not really to service patients without insurance. So unfortunately, many or most of the branded programs do help MS patients out in that regard. So when you enroll in a program with a drug, if it's a commercial insurance, meaning through your workplace and it's not Medicare, Medicaid, or TRICARE, then usually what you will be um, the way you will pay your co-payments for your drug will be through a charge card that the specialty pharmacy will maintain and monthly charge the company for your co-payment. But many times a company like, like a foundation, um, they ask the patient to look for, find, you know, for foundation funding first. And so if you're starting a drug in like August, September, November, all of the foundations at that time have already been depleted. So complications with changing medications. So when a brand medication goes generic, patients may lose the copayment assistance. We talked about that. We talked about specialty pharmacies that are just not really good at transitioning patients to generic drugs. Or he, here's an even better one. Mrs. Jones has been on Avonex since 1993, and she gets a letter from her insurance company that says her drug is no longer on the formulary list and her provider has to find a new medicine for her. So there, there are patients who are forced into these circumstances, and we try our best to not let that happen. Um, but unfortunately, um, with, with some of the prices and the type of insurance, we, we've had patients that have had to change medicine. And then when you look at changing a person's medicine because of an insurance list, um, the doctors have problems with that because that's not an ethical reason to change a person's therapy, okay? And so we take really, really strong um, actions and try our best to not let patients um, be thrown off of medications that work for them, okay? And then last but not least, and this is something you need to think about, okay? Drugs like Ocrevus, Kesempta, um, some of the drugs that have an effect on your white blood cell count, Gelenia, Mazen, these drugs can affect your white blood cell count. So what does that mean? It means if you have to stop the drug and start a new drug, there could be a period of time that you have to be off of medication in order for your white blood cell count to raise to a safe level. And so if you have been off of therapy for more than four weeks, let's say, then many patients get very, very anxious about being off a drug. And unfortunately, some of the drugs that are um, that do have an effect on the white blood cell count can depress the white blood cell count so low that it's not safe to start a therapy until their blood count comes up. So 
all of the MS patients out there may not even know that there are two therapies out there. And I mentioned this earlier about the infusion drug Lemtrada. But one of the ways that patients may be able to save considerably in the future is if they're on a therapy that actually has a termination in, in the therapy. And I am not advising patients to go on these therapies, but what I'm trying to do is show you the full spectrum of treatments that are available to patients and what some people are facing because of what's happening in the market. So there are two therapies that are available with a treatment duration of two years. And on both of these drugs, patients have had a very long period of being off drug, not having relapses, and not having disease progression and MRI lesion progression. The first one is Lemtrada. It's, it's, um, it's a total of eight infusions over two years, five for the first year, three for the second year. The infusions are a full day. So the first year of therapy is literally an entire week of infusion, okay? The second treatment is Mavenclad. And Mavenclad is an oral tablet. Um, the active ingredient is cladribine. Now, the thing about this drug is that um, the patient only takes between five and 10 tablets for two months for two years. So they might take a total of anywhere between um, 20 and 40 pills total, okay? Now, if we look at the cost of these therapies, Lemtrada, you're looking at probably with administration costs, you're probably looking at 250, 260,000 a year. Mavenclad, to give you an idea, seven tablets cost $68,000, okay? So you're looking at a drug that's basically priced at about $10,000 a tablet, all right? But the cost of the drug is high on the front end, but if a person doesn't have to take medication indefinitely, that could be a, a, a pretty worthwhile, not only clinical, um, circumstance, but it can be just an amazing cost in savings. So what do I do if I can't afford my medicines? Well, changing medication should be a clinical decision. It shouldn't be a financial one. But nowadays, um, we are seeing patients that are being forced off of certain medicines. So insurance Unfortunately, when your brand medication, which you have copay assistance for, goes generic and you try to appeal their denial of your medication, you can't say, um, please let Mrs. Jones stay on this medication because she will not be able to afford the alternative. They don't accept that as a reason to transition medicine, okay? So where we're seeing these issues is going to be from patients who are on brand Tecfidera. So Biogen offers a similar product. So if their provider is good with that product, they could stay with the company and consider that medication. But for instance, TRICARE, if you have been on Tecfidera, they will not approve Lumerity. So they will utilize generics because the, that's what the government does. They use inexpensive drugs, okay? And then ultimately, you want to speak to your provider and your office and, and their office to see what their recommendation is specifically for you. Because unlike insurance companies, we don't treat generically. We, we treat specifically. Now I'm gonna talk briefly about some other disciplines where
patient affordability has become an issue. And, and one of the ways that people are dealing with this is by de doing either group therapy or searching online for online content that doesn't cost them anything. So if you look at PT and occupational therapy, I mean, MS patients are, are those that require PT very frequently. And so when you see co-payments that are in the 20 to $200 range, that's out of reach for most people. And so when you see high co-payments, what does that do? Okay, let's say your co-payment is $65 and you need to see your therapist three times a week for two weeks, two times a week for two weeks, and once a week for two weeks. So if you do the math there, you're probably looking at about a thousand bucks out of pocket. Don't know that anybody can just pop that right out of their pocket. Why is that good for the insurance company? Because it discourages long-term therapy. The more the patient has to pay, they know that it's going to discourage therapy, right? So um, one of the things you could do is talk to a physical therapist, ask them how much he would charge you all for an hour's worth of instruction, get four or five people together, have them present at your MS group, and then everybody chip in 10 bucks and learn the, the best techniques in PT that you can afford. Okay. Some other ways to do it are, are to seek community resources or group therapy. Now, here in Jacksonville, um, we have some providers that started an MS yoga practice, and then we have a rehab facility and YMCA that does different exercise programs for MS patients that are totally free. So these are also things you should check out in your community. Now, I know as a chiropractor that we have been burdened with insurance never covering our discipline. So we're kind of used to patients paying out of pocket. And for those MS patients that have um, all types of insurances, chiropractic offices will accept most, um, most of the insurances. But like with PT, it's going to depend upon the services that we render. And believe it or not, the cost of rehab is pretty, pretty expensive. So the average session of rehab, and I got this off of a PT website, by the way, um, the average cost of PT can be up to 400 bucks a session. And so it just depends on how many things the therapist does with you, okay? And the typical out-of-pocket for patients who are in the MS realm is between 20 and $60. I verified that with Dr. Heather Barksdale, our neuro PT, who is an MS specialist. And she's saying that patients are dropping out of therapy, are only going for two weeks and asking for home programs because um, the copayments are breaking the bank for them. Now, let's say you don't have insurance or your insurance just doesn't want to cover it. Well, you could be paying 50 to $150 a, um, a visit. And so if you're looking at 12 visits in a month, that's, that's quite a bit of money, all right? So how do you finance that? Many people use credit cards, care credit, um, and I don't recommend that, okay? I don't recommend uh, taxing yourself financially if you can't handle it. My recommendation is to try to find alternatives before you do that, okay? And your care is going to depend on your therapist and how long you spend with them. So the more procedures they do and the more time they spend, the more it's going to cost. All right. And, and trust me, I had a PT visit done and the bill was like $1,100 for the first evaluation. So believe it or not, specialty care is expensive. The last thing I think I'm going to leave you with is it's springtime now. And in the spring, it's still kind of cool. And even though it's kind of cool, people aren't thinking about 
cooling apparel. So now is the time if you need cooling apparel for the hot weather, depending on where you live, to look at some of the programs that are available for cooling apparel. So the Multiple Sclerosis Association of America, the MSAA, they have a link for the cooling program. And then our wonderful folks at the MS Foundation, MS Focus, also has um, a cooling grants program. And these are good, but folks, um, they're going to be financially based. So if you make a bunch of money, um, let the folks that don't have a lot of resources get these, please. And we appreciate um, you listening in on this. So as I conclude, multiple sclerosis care is becoming very complicated. And with emerging therapies, more therapies are coming out, more expensive therapies, I believe, are on the horizon. There really is not enough financial and technical assistance to get patients on medication and keep them on it. I think that is one of the reasons that if we go back to looking at how many patients dropped off therapy, I would have to say that that is a major cause. The other thing is, as many of you don't realize, that there are these folks called pharmacy benefit managers, and they're the culprits of, um, of the process that add both confusion and red tape and cost to getting your medicines. They serve as a middleman and they do the determinations for the plans. So instead of Blue Cross doing it, um, Prime Therapeutics or CVS does it when they could do it themselves. So it adds an additional cost that's not needed, all right? And so when you talk to your legislators, tell them to put pressure on PBMs and insurance companies, tell them to um, take a hike because we don't need them, all right? It, here's the best analogy. Imagine if tomorrow you could not order a Wendy's hamburger or a Chick-fil-A sandwich. Instead, what you had to do is order it through a central distributor and your $5 Whopper or your $5 Chick-fil-A sandwich now is $20 because Louie, who runs the middleman service, has to make 10 bucks off the deal. So that's kind of the best way to describe it. I'm gonna conclude that way and open it up for questions. And I thank you all so much for your time and your attention. Fantastic, sir. Thank you so much, Dr. Chaffin. That was a, that was a very informative. Um, I uh, I wanted to ask, uh, would you be able to stay on for maybe like five, 10 minutes to answer some of these yeah. questions? Yes, I would love awesome. to. Okay, oh, fan pleasure. fantastic. So we have a bunch of cues ready to get aid. Uh, this individual asks, I'm currently taking reduction for two years having side effects Looking to try oral, is there any comparable? Yes. So if, if a person's on Rituxan, now we used to use Rituxan 15 years ago before we had the Ocrevus and Kesimpta. So in our practice, now keep in mind, I can't give you medical advice. You've got to talk to your provider about this, but Talk to your provider about the choices we would consider if a person has been on Rituxan would be either Ocrevus or Kesimpta. Those would be the, the drugs that would be the most similar to Rituxan. Okay. Yep. Uh, Jean asks, are generics approved with a plus or minus 20% within the equivalent of original drug, not clinically, just chemically? Well, the thing about it is, is it's kind of like our hands are tied and the generic companies are going to swear up and down that their products are going to be 
identical. But we know that there is some patients who are not going to have a positive effect from it. Unfortunately, when a product goes generic, the companies that make the brand make it almost impossible to continue to get the brand. So the patient has to make the decision, do they want to go ahead and try the generic? And I'll tell you the truth, I'm not going to lie, I'm a straight shooter. Most of our patients who have been on the generics have done fine. I don't think patients should worry about that. I think they should be more worried about being switched to a completely different drug that may not have the same effectiveness. Okay. All right. Exactly. Next question. What is the risk if you have to leave your DMT for diminishment of T cells and have to stay off of it for two years? Oh, no. Well, that that is definitely a clinical management decision that I couldn't answer because I mean, we don't want a, a person off a of therapy for more than a month, okay? We look at a month to six weeks as being the window that we hope a patient will be within when they change a therapy. But to be off a of therapy for, for more than a couple months is very dangerous, depending on the severity or aggressiveness of their condition. Okay. Yeah. Um, an individual wants to know: Is there an age that you consider M that you consider uh, not needing DMTs anymore? So there, there is some thought in the MS community that there are patients who have a secondary progressive, non-active situation to where they're comfortable in withdrawing and, and kind of really keeping an eye on the patient to make sure that there isn't any activity. Because what happens is the natural course of MS slows down after a period of time. And so if it becomes secondary progressive and then inactive, um, that there really isn't as much of a need for medicine, and it's definitely a clinical decision between the provider and the patient. Some patients do it because they're sick of taking drugs, and the provider may not even have a choice in it because they say, you know what, I'm just sick of doing this for 20 years. So. Okay, fair enough. Okay, um, Susan would like to know, I just checked dimethyl fumarate on GoodRx in Billings, Montana. Price for 30 days is $152. Where did you find it for $40? Well, okay. So whoever that person is, thank her for doing that. Thank her for doing that. Because what you're going to find is, folks, what's healthcare? Healthcare is a business, right? And aren't businesses geographical? Does a hamburger in Billings cost as much as a hamburger in New York City? Probably not. So GoodRx is going to adjust that price, probably according to the market and the geography. Okay. Um, okay. But here's the thing. To answer her question in full, if yeah. she's on the generic and has an insurance plan that can move her to an assistance program, We've had patients that have had a zero copay. So um, it all depends on if she has to use good RX as an alternative. Okay. Because if your insurance will cover it with a copay assistance, you may not have to pay $100 a month. Absolutely. All right. Okay. Um, I just want to, we have a couple of questions about your slides. Uh, specifically, you know, they want to know uh, about um, about the reference for the grants and foundations. I'm just going to let everyone know that this is recorded and will be posted to our Facebook page as well as our YouTube channel within uh, a week or so, so that you'll be able to reference that slide uh, there. 
uh, if they wanted to uh, look back and see which uh, specific foundations you're looking that you talked about. Yeah, and I've also email, emailed my presentation, and I'm happy to make it available if if the foundation you know would like to make it available to folks. Okay, that's yeah. fair fair enough. Um, let's move. We'll 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 talk about that at the end. Uh, we have time for two more questions. Okay. Um, so, uh, do some patients move from a monthly infusion? To one of the two DMTs, and in parentheses, Lemtrada, and I forgot the other, before they become Medicare eligible to potentially help them mitigate the higher costs once they move to Medicare. Yeah, yeah. The whole thing is, and this is this is where MS care becomes very tricky, and this is where you have to really have high level people, as far as a provider that make the decisions to go on those two therapies. Because think about it, um, there are a million MS patients in this country, right? And don't you think every one of them would like to get off of therapy? Of course, but that doesn't mean that everyone who has MS may be a specific fit for these two therapies. Now, I will tell you this, in fairness, Lemtrada is a risky drug, why? because a third, one third of the people in the trials got thyroid disease. So you have a 30% risk of getting thyroid disease if you end up on Lemtrada. So why do you think there are people who have said, you know what, that probably isn't a good fit for me, okay? But we have patients who did go that route and it's worked out beautiful for them. Why? Because they were eligible for that therapy. And that's what's tricky about MS care. Let me just mention one other thing before we leave. And that is research studies. When, re when a drug comes out, a drug is researched ag against one other drug. It's not researched against all the other drugs. So when a provider is making a decision to switch a patient from one drug to another, in more cases than not, they don't have a comparison to use as far as one drug to another because many times those drugs haven't been tested together. So much of MS care is based upon the experience of the provider and how well they know MS, for sure. So. Okay, um, sir, time for, do you have time for one more question? Yeah, yeah, sure. I appreciate it. Um, so I wonder if this is, you know, you can assist with this. I was recently informed about a possible scooter for mobility. I know a Bioness L300, two piece, one leg works. How does one afford any mobility device? I'd rather walk than ride. So mobility devices can be covered under insurances. So the best way to go about getting a mobility device is to see an occupational therapist or a physical therapist that specializes in doing wheelchair evaluations. And we use that term broadly. Um, the best thing to do, it's called a, a power, power motor device, PMD. And they can evaluate a patient to see if a scooter is better than an electric wheelchair is better than a rolling walker. They can evaluate the patient and give them the best fit for the device that they need. Once they do that, many insurances may cover the cost of that, like Medicare or even a private insurance. Okay, uh, Dr. Schaefer, it's, it's been such a pleasure. Uh, thank, you. thank you so much for this. Uh, I just wanna let everyone know this comes, this brings us to the end of our time. Uh, as I uh, stated previously, if you missed any part of this conference, it has been recorded and will be available through the MS Focus Facebook and YouTube channels. Uh, reply to your registration email for info on how to access recordings or sign up for our newsletter to learn about upcoming events. Our next teleconference will be the 2023 update on new MS treatments with Dr. Ben Thrower on Tuesday, March 14th at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Once again, we'd like to thank Biogen, Genentech, 
EMD Toronto, Sanofi, Beatrice, Sandoz, and Bristol Myers Squibb for the support of this program. Our sincere thanks to all of our attendees and especially to Dr. Chaffetz. Uh, you'll be receiving a survey after this presentation. We greatly appreciate you filling it out at your convenience. Uh, goodbye to everyone, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you so thank much. Thank you all. Have a great day, and thank you all for tuning in. I appreciate it.